और नंबर बोलो क्या नहीं डिवाइस 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 लेफ्ट माइक्रोफोन एचडी नहीं नहीं माइक्रोफोन पहला वाला ये वाला हाँ हाँ उसी का कैमरा ले लेगा सही हेलो 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 हाँ आ रहा है नहीं नहीं तुम्हें आवाज आ रहा है नहीं नहीं ये देखो ना ये 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 बाहर आ रहा है बाहर आ रहा है लेकिन वहाँ पे भी आ रहा है हेलो 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 हमारी शर्म नहीं है नंबर दो तो ठीक मिट का कंपनी ये तो चल ही नहीं गया हेलो ये तो चल ही नहीं गया हेलो शादी तीन बजे चल पहले जब भी आप बोलो पांच मिनट पहले इसका बटन दबा देंगे रिकॉर्डिंग हेलो हेलो ये हेलो 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 आएगा आएगा हेलो सो टाइम क्या कर रहा है हेलो 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 हाँ ना बोलो हेलो 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 Okay. Sir, the virus is going to be checked out. Okay. 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 Okay.
Hello, hello. Sound testing from YouTube. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Can you hear me now? Hello, hello. So, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is the second lecture in the series of Dr. A.K. Sundara Memorial Lectures. Uh, I of course process sent to talk about a case. Professor A.K. Sundara and introduce the speaker. Sir, please. Good afternoon and welcome to this very special lecture in memory of Dr. A.K. Sundaram. Nearly 50 years ago, at a place almost 20 kilometers from here, a place known as the Physical Research Laboratory, which most of you are familiar with, there had started an experiment on floating the fusion program in India. This was the vision of Dr. Sarabhai, who was then the director of PRL. So in, a, in the course of about a year or so, a group of seven members were selected from various places in India as well as abroad. Sarabhai had a vision of what he wanted to do. And this was, remember, in the early 70s, when fusion was really in a very nascent stage in many parts of the world. And he wanted that India should invest in this program. And therefore he had gone around actually hunting and trying to identify people who could take up this task. Among them was of course Professor Kao, who was the founder of this institute. But among those seven people was Dr. A.K. Sundaram. He was at that time working in space research in uh, close to Washington in the NASA Langley Center. And Sarabhai contacted him and actually he got a letter from the Secretary of DA uh, because Sarabhai at that time was the Secretary of DA asking him to come and see him at lunch time. So Sundaram went and actually uh, waited for him. So soon in about 10 minutes, Sarabhai called him in. This was the lunch hour. And Sarabhai was having his lunch. He was having a typical Gujarati lunch, which was Khakras. No, Khakra. So when Sundaram came in, Dr. Sarabhai offered him a Khakra. And also told him why he had called him. And questioned him for, for a few minutes. And at the end of it, not only did he have this khakra, but he also had a job offer from him. 
So that was the beginning of his return, reason for his return to India. And he joined this group of seven people in the physical research laboratory. For the next few years, this group actually planned a science program and also a training program. Also recruited a lot of students and Sundaram was responsible in many ways for making important contributions to this program. So that was the foundation of this fusion program that you now see today in India. Of course it didn't happen right away. It took a few years before this program was approved by the government and then it started as a plasma physics program and then the Institute for Plasma Research. Sundaram was also the first dean of this place and in his capacity as dean he set up the administration of this place and set everything in order and he actually oversaw the administration of this place for several years and he was known to be a very methodical and orderly person and he introduced very nice rules but in his human interaction with people he also started a tradition and a culture for administration here in this institute. Apart from that, of course, he was a very distinguished plasma physicist, well known for his theoretical contributions in many areas of plasma physics. He used to work in really frontier areas. He was equally diligent in doing work in space physics or in fusion physics and tokamaks. Like he worked on tearing modes, ruining modes, and also many fluid instabilities. He had a very strong background in applied mathematics and therefore whatever it did, it did it with great mathematical precision and rigor and that was his characteristic signature. All his work at that time was done in long hand. His notes were beautiful and he used to do these very long calculations. I have had the privilege of working with him for several years. We were very close friends and also collaborated in research for many, many years. His office was right next to mine. So, you know, we only had to hop in into each other's office to discuss problems for a long time. So for me, his passing away was a very personal loss. He retired in 1993 and then immigrated to the U.S. but continued to work there for several years in topics like magnetic recurrection and uh, magnetospheric physics and all that. So, Given this rich legacy and the contributions to the foundation of the institute that he had made, to honor his memory, his family uh, contributed some funds and asked to institute this annual memorial lecture, which is conducted every year by the Plasma Science Society of India. And the condition was that the lecture should be given by an eminent physicist preferably in a, whose work is in an area that overlaps with that of Professor Sundar. So this year we are very fortunate to have a speaker who qualifies on both accounts. He is a very eminent physicist, a space plasma physicist, who has worked extensively in many areas of space physics and also in fundamental areas of physics. And he is also known as a Sundaram personally and has been his friend for many years. I will not give his full introduction. I will ask Shishi to do that. But let me thank him for accepting our invitation and uh, graciously coming down here to Ahmedabad to deliver this second A.K. Sundaram Memorial Lecture. Thank you, Dr. Lakshmi. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sen. And uh, <coughs> we have uh, also known Dr. Sundaram because we were the first batch. YouTube. YouTube? Yes. Okay. So, um, uh, Dr. Rakhina has been visitor to IPR and uh, a number of um, people would remember Dr. Lakina. Uh, he did his uh, master's and PhD from IIT Delhi and his uh, subsequent uh, 
worked at a number of places. Uh, he was at NASA, JPL. Uh, he was a Humboldt Fellow. Uh, he has quite an impressive record as visiting scientist. He is very distinguished. He is the winner of the American Geophysical Union Award 2015, K.R. Ramnathan Award, <coughs> Decennial Award <coughs> uh, of the Indian uh, Geophysical Union. And uh, he has been uh, quite uh, quite an institution builder in the Indian Institute of Geomagnetism. So his uh, contributions are well known. He's mentored a number of students and researchers and he's got an impressive uh, list of uh, well-cited papers. His uh, number of uh, important discoveries include the polar cap boundary layer waves. He's done extensive work in magnetospheric and uh, <coughs> uh, nonlinear waves, uh, particularly uh, the alpha waves, the microstructure of the solar wind. He's been uh, quite instrumental in bringing the the observatory at low latitudes into real problems. His his theories uh, have been borne out by the experiments, especially satellite borne measurements. So he's, uh, we are very, very lucky to have him here and uh, to, to various people who like alpine waves, kinetic waves, nonlinear waves, solitons, it's going to be a rich treat. Dr. Lakina, we are happy to have you here. Thank you very much for the kind words. I am thankful to PSSI for giving me an honor to be the second Sundram Mori lecture. He was a very good friend. In fact, initially I was in a great uh, because I was just a student when I first met him. But after that, I had a lot of interaction with him. While I was uh, doing some small stint of a visiting scientist at Physical Research Laboratory. Then I joined Indian Institute of Geomagnetism in 1973. But I used to come to QRL at least once or twice, or maybe even more, um, for a lot of consultation with people. So, I used to come mainly because uh, to interact with Professor Doty, who was my um, PhD supervisor, and then Dr. Vijit Singh, Dr. Sundram, R. Pratap, and Dr. A.C. Das, and other plasma scientists in the plasma group. So all this interaction actually, I also grew up with it. And with all these things, I was able to set up a space plasma group in IAG. And thanks to Professor Sundram, he had always, you see, from a very high position, we became kind of a friend. Even after he left PRL, he, he came to IPR and then he went to GSFC. I was in touch with him and I visited his home also. And uh, for me it was a great loss when I heard about the sad demise. Anyway, he, uh, he has done so much good work and he has inspired me. And uh, I hope with my this lecture, I will be able to inspire at least some of you. So with this, uh, I will start my lecture. And before I really start my lecture, I would like to thank two people. One is Professor Carl, Carl Schindler. He actually introduced me to Tearing Mode and Microspheric Substance, which is the title here. Uh, when I was visiting his institute in 1981-82, and then the other person I want to thank is Bruce Rutani of uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He introduced me to the polar cap boundary layer wave as uh, mentioned. And also magnetic storm. Magnetic storm is also 
easier. So we, we, we thanking these people, I will uh, start my lecture. And I will, I have made it very simple. I think there is only one, one and a half equation perhaps. You realize and that's it. Uh, how do I, how, how do I change this? I have spoken all this thing. So I am simply going further. Only thing is, I will try to make it as simple as possible and try to bring the context of my lecture with the Dr. Sundar's work. Before I do that, I will show some of the work of Dr. Sundaram which concerns the talk here. How do I? Why you have to do this? Mouse. That will not work in India. Okay, 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 it is fine. These are some of the work of Dr. Sundram, which are on dealing modes. Which are, which are related to only space physics part, not to the lab plasma or other way. So, so you can see there is one um, work by Sundram and Abhiji on the biokinetic analysis of Turing instability in the collision plasma. Then Sundram work and then Sundram and Fairfield and uh, Vesiliadis. And this is excitation of the lower hybrid wave delta V effect in the crunch field. And then Sundram and Fairfield. In fact, Sundram and Fairfield did lot of work on substorm, tearing mode and substorm. So this is the work which is uh, related to this to my talk. And then Sundram and Fairfield and so, so many other works are there. In fact, when I was a student, I was uh, 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 and Sina and Sundram work uh, was published. And at that time, it was so difficult for me to understand this. Thing. And only after so many years when I went visited Germany, only when I realized the importance of Dr. Sundram's work. So I have outlined my talk like this. First I will talk about magnetic reconnection. Uh, I have said studied reconnection and spontaneous reconnection. Then magnetospheric substorm and tearing modes. And then I will consider the magnetic storm, supermagnetic storm and case history of one storm, which is called the Carrington storm. And it will be very clear why I want to discuss this only. And then what are the effect on society of this research on magnetospheric substorm and storm? How it affects our society? And after that I will summarize. You see, magnetic reconnection has been now recognized as a fundamental process which converts magnetic energy into plasma, kinetic energy and internal energy in the plasma flows and it also allows the transfer of plasma magnetic flux and mass between different topological regions. You see, you can conceive this process as just the opposite of um, dynamic process. You see, in the sun people were studying how the solar magnetic field is formed and then the reverse of that was proposed by Giovanni in 1947 to explain how the solar flares are produced and where they get their energy. He proposed long back in 1947 that the process of conversion of magnetic energy into the energy of flow and all, that's how the solar flare get their energy. And they end up doing it. He applied the same idea to the day side magnetic reconnection to explain the energy transport from the solar wind to the magnetosphere. So I will just come back to the previous slide. So here you can see on one side this is a region 1 in which the magnetic field is uh, pointed upward. Then there is region 2, sorry, region 3 where it is um, pointed downward. Both regions are brought together. And then you can see the separate things are there. And now the whole thing gets divided into four regions. 
in between two and between four, you can see the topology has changed. Now, here you have the magnetic field line going up, here they are coming down, but now they come down and, up and then flow. So this is the basically the magnetic reconnection. The interesting point here is only where these um, two different flux regions they meet, there is a separator we call the X line. When there is the X line and there is the electric field along the X line, only then magnetic reconnection occurs. Otherwise, it does not. So I will make it more simpler concept. And for that, uh, I have used this equation, as I said. In a plasma, the, we can write the Ohm's law as E plus E cross B equal to eta J, where J, E, B, and V and eta are respectively the electric current density, the electric field, the magnetic field, the um, plasma fluid velocity, and the electric resistivity. Now, for a highly conducting plasma, one can say eta equal to zero. Then, if you put eta equal to zero, then E plus V plus B equal to zero, or we can say V equal to E plus B by B square. So, what does it shows? It shows that the magnetic field and the flow they are frozen together. As plasma flows out, it drags the magnetic field along the way. In other words, if fluid element is on some magnetic flux tube, it will always remain there. So this this is further seen here. Here you see we have magnetohydrodynamic regime in which there is a one flux tube here. There are two fluid element, plasma element A and B, and there is another one which is the opposite, opposite topology, C and D, both are brought together. When they come together in a very small region, there is a breakdown of MHD. When there is a breakdown of MHD, then you can see that instead of A and B on the same flux tube, now B and C are on the same flux tube, and A and D are on this, and they are moving away from each other. So the swapping of this partner, this is basically the magnetic reconnection. Now, how it is initiated and all, that is not the time here for me to explain. But basically, this is what happened. Now, as we have seen, the magnetic reflection involves breakdown of MHT approximation and frozen in field concept, which comes because of the MHT. Now, dissipative term, usually they are negligible when you consider the overall size of the system. But in a very narrow region, the dissipative term, say resistivity, can become very important. And once it is very important, the reconnection can occur, and then there can be dramatic changes in the large scale plasma flows because of the reconnection which is taking place in a very small place. Now there are two types of reconnection. One is a steadily driven or forced reconnection. In this as I showed you the geometric, the magnetic reconnection is assumed to be occur continuously in a steady manner. Here, why it happens in a steady manner? Because of the external boundary condition is forcing the plasma to come together. And it is accurate. The second type of reconnection is the spontaneous reconnection or tearing mode instability. Here, the system, it becomes unstable because of the internal instability, which is the tearing mode. And it is a time-dependent reconnection. Now, to get an overall view of both type of reconnection, one can refer to my paper in Bhasi, that is the Bulletin of Astronomical Society of India in 2000. So, it discusses in detail all the steady-state model and all time-dependent model of reconnection. Now to come to the next topic of my lecture, now, I have to give a very brief account of how sun and earth are connected via plasma. As you know, sun is emitting um, visible light, x-rays, ultraviolet, but sun is also emitting charged particles, which are coming out of it all the time, and it is going out everywhere. And we call it solar wind. Now when the solar wind is coming out of the sun, because it is highly conducting gas, as I said, magnetic field is frozen in the flow, 
to improve the solar magnetic field also. So when we when it comes to the Earth's orbit, near the Earth, so so it has the solar magnetic field which of, which are of the order of five nanometers. And the density of the particles are about five to ten particles per centimeter. And the flow at the sun in the average solar wind is about 250 kilometer per second. So these are the characteristics of the solar wind. Now, how magnetic reflection comes into picture is this. Here solar wind is coming and now here this is the earth. This is the um, cut of the earth internal thing. Earth magnetic field is produced in the outer core. This is the outer core. Inner core is solid, so it cannot produce the magnetic field. The magnetic field is produced in the outer um, liquid core and it is a more or less a dipole field. Now, the solar wind is coming as I told you. It, density is about 10 particle per centimeter cube. Magnetic field is also with it and 250 kilometer per second is this thing. So, it compresses this. So, it compresses it into the form of the magnetosphere. On the day side, the magnetic field is compressed. On the, day, on the night side, it is extended like a comet tail. And here, it shows the auroras. Auroras are formed here. I, I will discuss about that part. And this is called the auroral zone, which is about 65 to say 72 degree magnetic latitude in both this hemisphere as well as this hemisphere. Now, the, how the energy goes from solar wind to the magnetosphere is by the magnetic reconnection. Oh, no, before I do that, let me explain the various current systems which are in the magnetosphere. One is the current which is at the magneto, magnetopause. This is the magnetopause. This is the outer outermost boundary of the magnetosphere. And this is the magneto tail. There is a magneto tail current which is uh, here, this thing. And there is a ring current which circulates around the earth and there are the field aligned currents and we don't have to worry about other currents but these are the only currents which I will be talking in my talk. So here, this is sun, so solar wind is coming here, it is dragging the IMF is the interplanetary magnetic field, the solar magnetic field is dragged here and when it is pointing southward, downward direction, and earth magnetic field on this side points from upward like this. When they both come together, there is a magnetic reconnection. Now, this field line contains the magnetospheric plasma as well as the solar plasma and it is dragged with the flow toward the night side. So, the energy goes into the tail. Now, the first field line is reconnected, then the next, then the next. So, like that, the, all the energy from the day side is going into the light magnetosphere. And then there is again a reconnection in the tail side and the plasma is thrown towards the earth. And then it comes and it forms a ring current here. So the motion of the plasma like this and here like this is called the uh, magnetospheric convection. It is driven because of the electric field. And now because the energy comes here and some of the, most of the energy goes into the high latitude magnetic field line and where they, uh, the energetic electron, they produce the auroras. So usually you will see the auroras in the auroral zone only. But there can be a situation when the, this tail, this energy stored in the magneto tail spontaneously released and when it comes towards the earth, then auroras can move towards the equator and become more energetic and that is the phenomenon of substorm. And then I will discuss the magnetic spherics in storm after that. Now the direct entry because of the magnetic reconnection is 5 to 10 percent of the solar wind ram energy and it and reconnection is effective only when the magnetic interplanetary magnetic field is directed southward. But when it is northward, the reconnection does not occur. But the wave particle interaction at the magnetopause, they scatter the particle inside the magnetosphere 
and 0.1 to 0.3 percent of the solar wind energy is still um, enter into the magnetosphere. So whatever will be the condition, the energy from the solar wind, energy when I say it is the particle energy, energy from the solar wind is being transferred into the magnetosphere. Now the phenomena of the substorm. Now like the Earth's magnetosphere, like its atmosphere, is never at rest. One of the many dynamic features, perhaps, is the most important is the magnetospheric substorm. It occurs over a period of one to a few hours, during which the energy stored in the magnetotail because of the um, reconnection occurring on the day side when IMF is on the southward direction. So energy is um, stored in the magnetotail and suddenly explosivity is released and it comes towards the inner magnetosphere. And the energy is in the particle between 5 to 50 kV and the strong plasma flows of 100 to 1000 km per second. So, so they are generated and, and they are dissipated in the near earth night side region. So aurora become widespread and intense and they also become much more agitated because energy is being put explosively there. And earth magnetic field, especially in the high altitude region, is agitated. These are the Aurora's picture taken by one of our colleague, Dr. Arun Hanchalal of IAG in Metri Station in Antarctica. So he has taken this picture. But Aurora's can be not only green always, it can be yellowish, it can be even red, red Aurora's. So it, it, it has different uh, colors and it has different shapes. Now during the substorm activity, the cross tail current, I told you, because in the magneto tail, there is a current which is uh, cross tail current. So that, that is disrupted. And then a part of the energy flows along the uh, magnetic field aligned currents. And it will come and enhances the rain current. And, and when the lot of energy comes into the high altitude ionosphere, uh, they also intensify the auroral electrojet. And, and which is actually in the westward direction. So that is also that intensified. The magnetospheric convection increases, mean the flow of plasma from the tail region towards the inner magnetosphere will become much faster. And a part of the plasma sheet is severed from the earth forming a plasma this, which flows out in the tailward direction. I, I will show you the plasma in, in just in a minute. When the substorm frequently occurs, they can give rise to magnetic storm. Substorm like thunderstorm is basically a disturbed phenomena. I have shown you a comparison between the two. On this side is a thunderstorm and this side is a substorm. Now you can see the thunderstorm, there is a disturb between different cloud to cloud or cloud to earth. And, and it is a natural phenomenon and it, uh, it involves the electric discharge. Here also, it is a discharge phenomenon. It occurs in a localized region in the um, magneto tail, well far, I mean about say it's an, um, 10 to 15 earth radii, away, away from the earth. But these are very close, few um, kilometers, few kilometers. But these are localized um, in region. But these are localized in time because they occur over a different wide local time but they occur for a short time. Both are transient phenomena. So here the each lightning stroke is very specially localized. Here the substorm intensification is also localized. So there are quite a few similarities between the two. Now if you see a typical substorm, how does it look? So it has initially a growth phase which begins with the start of the southward turning of IMF, polar cap size and cross section of the magnetotail increases and the near earth plasma sheet starts thinning and dipolar magnetic field is stretched into a tail like field. These are all the space observations which I am not showing but I will only show you the overall observation here. So second is the expansion phase. The midnight sector there is a sudden brightening in the discrete overall arc and the rapid forward and advancement 
injection of energetic particles that intensify the recurrent and plug mold formation. And recovery phase, uh, everything um, try to recover and our orders try to recede towards a uh, um, high latitude. Now here you see, this, this are the role activity. Now this is a quite time thing. You can see there are very few auroras here. Now when the uh, growth phase starts, so, so the auroras starts coming towards later this. First activity is more and then they try to expand uh, local time wise as well as towards the high, uh, equator side. And then here, this is the peak of the thing. So we have a lot of auroras coming down. And this is the, when the recovery starts. Now there are several models, but I will discuss only the one model here. And based on the nature of the solar wind energy input and that of the stored energy in the magnetosphere. There are several statistical studies which show that the substorm clearly has both directly driven and loading and loading component. When we say loading and loading, it means the energy from, from the day side goes to the night side to, and it gets stored in the magneto tail. And then uh, it is released. This is loading and loading. Directly driven is when outside boundary condition, they force the energy in the tail to release. The study based on linear prediction filtering technique indicates that the typical time for the driven and loading and loading processes are 20 minutes and 1 hour respectively. Two main models are reconnection model and the current disruptive model. I will only show the one model. Ah, this is the reconnection model. This is the near earth neutral line model, it is called, which was proposed by Holmes in 1979. It treats the substorm phenomena as a loading and unloading process. Now the growth phase is due to enhanced day-side magnetic reconnection, which leads to a larger tail size and thinning of the plasma sheet. So what I mean is here, this is the growth phase. So, so plasma tail, this becomes larger. The magnet magnetic energy which is stored in the magneto tail is released explosively through magnetic reconnection process in the vicinity of a newly formed neutral line due to terrain mode instability in the near earth tail region. That is this. When, when the energy is being loaded from here, at, at this stage, there is a new neutral line is formed. At, at, at this point, and this is due to the tearing, tearing instability. And once reconnection occurs, and this is the so-called plasmoid I was saying, a magnetic island kind of thing, this plasmoid is formed and this goes away from this thing tail and, and it gets simply cut off from here and, and the whole thing goes into the space. And then in the recovery, the again the whole thing recovers and comes to the original thing. So, so this is, I will close the atmospheric substorm topic here. I come to the magnetic storm. Now, magnetospheric substorm work the in, internal process. The, the thing which gives rise to the explosive energy release was the tearing instability. This is where the Dr. Sundan work played very important role for magnetospheric substorm. Now, storms are different. They are the driven one and they are driven by the driver which are at the sun like the coronal mass ejection, solar flares, fast strains from the coronal holes, coordinating interaction regions, etc. And only when these ejectors have southward interplanetary magnetic field component, then only they give rise to magnetic storm. Suppose all these things come but the magnetic field is in the northward direction, then they don't produce any magnetic storm. So magnetic storm is characterized by a main phase during which the horizontal component of the Earth's low latitude magnetic fields are significantly depressed over a long span of time from a few hours followed by its recovery, which may extend for several days. So you see the magnetic substorm are basically 
high latitude phenomena. Magnetic storm are basically I mean low latitude phenomena, but it affects the whole whole globe, whether in low latitude or high latitude, it will be it, um, it affects the whole um, whole globe you can see. In this, the magnetic tail plasma gets injected into the right side magnetosphere and it keeps on getting injected steadily. Not only one explosive release, but it keeps on getting injected continuously. And when the proton, they start drifting westward, the electron you know, drift eastward because of the magnetic curvature. And they form a ring around the earth, which we call a ring current. The ring current gets very much intensified during magnetic storm and it moves closer to the earth. And because it comes closer to the earth and it is very intensified, it produces a depression in the geomagnetic field H component that causes the main phase of the magnetic storm. Now the strength of the magnetic storm is measured by hourly index D, uh, which is DST index. DST stands for Disturbance Storm Time Index. And more recently, there is one minute resolution index has been used, that is same H, symmetric H index. Both are expressed in nanotesla. The aerosol activity becomes very intense because now energy is being fed towards the earth continuously. So a lot of energy is going towards the high latitude you know, field line, where they come, uh, in, in, cause a lot of auroras. And auroras come down to the um, very low latitude. Uh, at least mid latitude, you know, sub rural to mid latitude. So here I show this um, solar flare. Solar flare actually is the tremendous explosion on the surface of the sun. This is on the photosphere. Within few minutes, they heat material to many millions of degrees and release as much energy as billion megaton of TNT. The upper near complex sunspot. Now this is the CME picture which is taken by the Soho spacecraft. Now CME, they are huge bubble of gas threaded with magnetic field you know, that are ejected from the solar corona over the course of several hours and lot of energy is released. And, and you see the CME, it has a brighter thing, outer loop, then it is a little darker one and then there is a third portion is the, the filament which is very close to the surface. So, so that was near the sun, but near the 1 AU orbit, uh, the CME is called ICME, interplanetary coronal mass ejection. Because it is moving with a very high speed, it has a shock in front of it. And then there is a sheet, sheet region, and then you, we have an ICME driver gas here. And then a, this is the magnetic cloud where the temperature is uh, very low and the magnetic field is quite strong. And th this is how the CME, which is from the sun, look very different. At the Earth orbit, they look very different. Now, slow and fast stream. Now, the slow stream is going, goes like this. And the fast stream, when it comes, it overtakes the slow stream, compresses it. There is an interface between the two. And there is a fast forward shock and a reverse shock. And the whole thing co-rotates with the rotation of the sun. That's why it is called co-rotating interaction region. And this is CME and solar flare. In both these cases, magnetic reconnection is playing a very basic role for the energy release of the solar flare as well as the coronal mass injection. Now, in the solar maximum um, I mean, report, uh, mostly the ICMEs, they cause the magnetic storm. So it has uh, storm sudden commencement and then onset of the storm when the DST starts decreasing and then recovery. And the solar minimum, the magnetic storms are usually caused by CLR and they may or may not have initial phase. In fact, most of these storms don't have the initial phase. They simply have this you know, onset and then very, very long recovery. This is how the two are differentiated. 
now what is very important for us is the superhuman magnetic storm. As I told you, the magnetic storm are measured in Nana Tesla. And here we define the super magnetic storm which have DST less than minus 500 magnetism. They are very rare, but they are the largest societal and technological relevance. Such storms can cause life-threatening power outages, satellite damage, setcom failure, navigational problem, and loss of low Earth orbiting satellites. The Tata power support magnetic storm is rather very scarce. For example, only one truly super intense magnetic storm has been recorded DST of minus 589 in the Tesla on March 13, 1989 during the space age. Now I will discuss one of the most discussed magnetic storm in the literature. That is the September 1, 1859 Carrington solar flare and it created a storm on the September 2. Carrington, we observed a white light solar flare on September 1st and then he had a hand drawing of the sunspot which is there. And these are all active region. We know the solar flare or CM, solar flare comes from the active region. And when this thing occurred, the red glows were reported as visible from within 23 degree of the geomagnetic equator in both north and south hemisphere during this display of September 1, 2. This is, um, this is the timber which is uh, in 1960 he reported. Not only this, there were widespread fires which were caused by the electric discharge from the telegraph wire, both in Europe as well as uh, in the US. And telegraph was the highest technology, latest technology of that time. And for many hours to days, the communication between Europe and the US was disrupted. And it's very interesting, on the 1st September 1859 solar flare was also observed by R. Hodgson, but somehow in literature it came to be known as Carrington flare. It happens all the time. Some people, they get the time light and the other, they don't. Now it is very interesting, the very next day a severe magnetic storm was recorded by Q Observatory and some other observatories, especially Kolaba Bombay. Carrington knew about the occurrence of the magnetic storm but failed to connect it to the solar flare. He, he writes uh, in his paper, once weather does not make a summer in, in, in monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. As I said, during this magnetic storm, many fires were set by arcing from currents in the telegraph wire. Now anyway, it took 100 years after that to get sufficient statistics to make a convincing case that there is an association between the solar flare or CME and the magnetic storm. So now everybody believes, but at that time nobody believed, even the person who discovered it. Now this is, uh, we try to recreate to what caused um, this super magnetic storm because it had the attention of everyone at that time. So we reduce the data of the global magnetic observatory and, uh, and this is the magnetogram which we uh, reproduce. And then within present knowledge which we have gained in this, during the space age, we try to see what caused this uh, magnetic storm. Now we use uh, two information. One information was that the auroras were seen 23 degrees, and they were red auroras. It means plasma form, I'm sorry, plasma sphere was uh, at 23 degrees. With this, we calculated the conversion electric field, which is responsible. We got 20 millimeter per meter. Then, um, Carrington himself has given the transit time from this, um, of the solar wind, you think, uh, 17 hours and 40 seconds from sun to the earth. With this and the other um, correlation studies which are well known in the literature, we calculated the interplanetary electric field 
and we got 160. Many more per meter. But both are matching quite well. Now we use this value and put it in the bottom equation, which is very well known, which correlates the rate of change of DST with the energy input from the in solar wind. Only thing we used from this monitogram was that the main phase lasted hour and a half. With this we got the DST value as minus 1760 nanotesla. And which we said it is consistent with the depression which is of the order of 1600, this magnetic depression. And this is the, and the likely mechanism which we um, propose is that the intense short duration superstorm would be a magnetic cloud with the intense southward magnetic field. In fact, the magnetic field we calculated, is, it should have the southward magnetic field of the order of 90 nanotesla, so which, which can cause this thing. So now here, this thing, our value of the DST was matching with the um, delta H depression at Kulab. So anyway, but many people, it is it is big controversy. I will try to explain that controversy also. To you. Now the Carmentian storm is the largest in anything that we have seen so far. In comparison, 1989 storm, which knocked down hydrocubic electrical grid was only DST minus 589 minutes. Now there are uh, other supermagnetic storms in the present space age. March 13, of course, I have discussed. 30th October, there was a big magnetic storm with minus DST of minus 400 nanotesla. And 20th November 2003, minus 490 nanotesla. And, and this storm is the largest storm of solar cycle 24, only 223 nanotesla. But on 23rd July 212, there was a CME which was on the back side of the sun, not towards the earth, other side of the sun. If it had, if it, it had hit us, because it has speed of 1910 kilometer and the southward magnetic field was 52 nanotesla. If it had hit the earth, it would have produced minus 1180 nanotesla. It would have been a real disaster, but anyway, it, it was on the other side, it did not hit us, so we were safe. So this is the 1989 um, super storm. This is actually three-step storm. Um, DST was decreasing, then it started increasing, then again decreasing, then again. So, so I will not go into the causes for this thing, but I will discuss the controversies, because to complete this talk, I must see what are the controversies about Carrington magnetic storm. There are three controversies. First is the controversy on the magnitude. Sultani and co worker, they predict DST of minus 1760 nanotesla. Cisco and co worker, they say DST is minus 859 nanotesla, but they take hourly average of Kulaba monitogram as proxy for DST. Now, this is, anyway, I will come to that. Now, there is another person, Hayakawa and co worker. They say DST is again minus 918, minus 979 and minus 949 nanotesla under three different scenarios which they discuss in their paper. Again, they consider hourly averages of Kulaba, Monto, Gram and proxy for DST. The second controversy is cause for the large drop in H component. Uh, we say it is caused because of the ring current. And Akasaku and Kamidin and Sid and Kovaka, they say it is by field alignment currents. And, and the third, uh, and high power alternative, they say it is rain current if in the electric field in the interplanetary medium is 2700 millivolt per meter, which is 10 times actually the value which we got. Otherwise, it is the ionospheric current. Uh, again, there is a um, controversy over the fast recovery. Lee and co-worker, 
they say the fast recovery is due to a high density plasma plug. And the seed bank overturn, they have given a very complicated scenario. They say that if the rate of change of DST has a non-linear dependence on DST itself, then it can have a very fast recovery. It is a very complicated scenario. No? Now, what we think, item 1 and 2, which are magnitude and the cause for drop in H component, we are not convinced with the argument. Why? First, the hourly average of H component of Kulaba microgram, or as a matter of fact, any other magnetic observatory, does not represent the true DST. The standard DST is based on hourly observation from several magnetic observatories which are widely distributed in longitude rather than from a single observatory. So assuming hourly average of Kulaba due to the DST is a very wrong concept. Secondly, the estimate of DST for Carrington magnetic storm which Suzani and Kovarkar and Lakina and Kovarkar we did, we did it from completely different thing. We, we did it from two processes. One was calculation of the um, magnetospheric conversion field because of the um, observation of auroras at 23 degrees. And also we have an another method, transit time, 17 hours and 40 minutes from sun to the earth of the solar flare. And both give consistent values. And then from the Burton equation we calculated DST. So the value which we got consistent with the depression of H at Kulaba. Nowhere we said in our paper that at a depression represents the DST value of strong. How is this misconception propagated in, in the literature? We don't know. Thirdly, one should note that the Kulaba observatory is a near equatorial 10 degree latitude station. Field around currents cannot contribute to the magnetic signature at Kulaba Observatory as its location is far away from the equatorial influence as well as from the Aurora region. In the Aurora region, of course, field around currents are important. But here, they don't occur at all. Further, we are not sure how high Kawa and, and cover can they reduce interplanetary electric field of 2700 millivolt per meter are needed for fast build of ring current to cause the sharp difference. So they have not done any mechanism, they have simply quoted this value and how they have quoted it is not very clear to at least to us. Anyway, this is very highly unrealistic. Now, the item 3, the likely cause of fast recovery. Kozera and Kovarkar, they have found the high plasma density solar filament. You see CME picture I showed you, there was an outside bright thing and there was a dark thing and there is again a bright filament. That filament is the sun, sunward, most sunward part of the um, CME. That is the high density plasma. So, so, so the, they have the solar filament. This could be the plasma plug which is required by Lee et al. Because we never know whether in 1859 this thing occurred or not. But there is a, in the meantime, there is another likely mechanism of the fast storm recovery. And that could be due to the rain current losses caused by the electromagnetic ion cyclotone, EMIC wave scattering of the photon and other things. So, so this is the one most likely because the, because the uh, ring current losses by EMIC waves, they are very fast. So one can have it um, the fast um, recovery of the other of um, power of sun. Now, question arises, can the supermagnetic storm occur in future? Right? This is the relevant question for society. And can the magnetic storm more intense than Carrington even occur in future? And, and what is the probability of extreme super, super storm? So I will briefly discuss this thing. First thing is, 
is the Pennington event the biggest possible storm? We try to answer this. The, our theoretical prediction for a biggest possible magnetic storm under the assumption, we made two assumptions, that the maximum CME speed at the sun is 3000 km per second, which the observation by the zero and shaver uh, attack, they indicate. And then we assume the interplanetary deceleration of, of 10 percent. And then we carry out our calculation using the plasma physics knowledge. Then we find that the maximum D at one Earth, radio, uh, Earth orbit, one AU, is 127 nm and E maximum is 340. Now, 127 uh, as predicted by Haveka. With, with such a high speed, we get only 340 mV per meter at one AU. And the DST could be 3500 nm it is almost double of the current energy. Now this will also cause the sudden impulse amplitude of delta H239 and the rate of change of dB dt 39 tesla per second and currently of this sun. Now what is the occurrence probability of current and type substorm? All the details are given in our article in extreme events in geospace and all. But I will just uh, uh, summarize. How often will a current and event occur? Can one answer this by using statistics which are available to us now? Our answer is no. However, many people have attempted to predict when a current and type supermagnetic storm event will occur in the future, given some caveat, and they have used different uh, uh, methods. Now the prediction varies from 500 years to 40,000 years and, and, and some of the references are Willis and all and then Subasochi and Amuda, Riley, Lau, Katapoa, Vermulu, all these things. If you read these papers, you will see that between 500 years to 40,000 years predictions are there. Now you can note there is a big variability in the prediction and it is very difficult oh, but not impossible to say determine with accuracy you, you can predict but what is the accuracy you do not know now the predictability of Connington level events require knowledge of either full understanding of the physical processes which cause extreme ICMEs and magnetic storm or good empirical statistics unfortunately we have no we, we have very poor empirical statistics of only one or two in super mid storm has occurred. And uh, we don't know to what is the ultimate limit for the sun to, to give the solar um, so, solar flare of CM um, how fast and uh, what kind of magnetic field. And we don't know the saturation at the sun of the magnetic field in an active region. Because even if you take active region, we do not know what percentage of this energy will be released. Active region may be big, it may have very big um, energy per se, but what fraction will come out, we do not know. Because we don't, don't know the physical causes, neither we know the statistics. So we believe at this um, stage of our knowledge, we cannot predict um, when the probability of current and event occurring in the near future. Now the effect on society. I will briefly discuss this. This is the last topic. Modern society as we know is becoming ever increasingly dependent on space technology for daily routine function such as communication, navigation, data transmission, global surveillance, atmospheric weather. Everything we depend on this. Intense substorm and magnetic storm, they create hostile space weather conditions that can generate many hazards to spacecraft as well as technological system. Strong geomagnetically induced current which are produced by sudden short period variation in the geomagnetic field during substorm as well as magnetic storm. They can damage power trans transmission line and corrode long pipeline. They can 
also cause life threatening power outages such as hydrophobic power failure during 13 to 14 months in the next storm. Now the flux of relativistic electron in the magnetosphere increases many folds during intense magnetic storm and substring. And it can lead to failure and malfunction of satellites instrument due to deep electric charging that, that, that effect. During the past decade alone, many spacecraft either malfunctioned for several hours or they were lost permanently. When due to the adverse solar space weather condition during intense magnetic storm. Very recently, on 3rd February 2022, 39 Starlink satellites were released into low Earth orbit, orbiting satellite uh, orbits and 32 were lost within 48, 48 hours due to moderate magnetic storm condition. How they got lost? Because when the magnetic storm occurs, the atmosphere gets heated up and then it rises up. When it rises above, it produces a big drag effect on the low Earth orbiting satellites. Because of that, those satellites got lost. Suppose it was a magnetic storm of Carrington Hill, not only the low Earth orbit satellite, even these, some satellites which are above, they also get lost. Summary. Magnetic reconnection controls the transfer of energy from the solar wind to the magnetosphere. Magnetic, magnetic storms are directly driven by solar and interplanetary causes like CME, solar flare, CIR, etc. Magnetospheric substorms are not directly driven but rather occur due to internal instability, that is, steering mode instability of the magnetosphere. The ultimate source, of course, is the energy of the solar wind. Dr. Sundaram's work has profound effect in understanding the onset and other characteristics of magnetospheric substance. Magnetospheric substorm and storm are indicator of geomagnetic activities. The September 1 to 8, 1859 Carrington magnetic storm is the most intense magnetic storm in the recorded history with the DST of minus 1760 magnetic at this stage, it is not possible to answer how often will a Carrington-like event occur with any, with any certainty. However, storm stronger than the Carrington event can occur under ideal conditions, perhaps as, like, as high as twice larger. If such a magnetic storm does occur, it would have disastrous effect on modern society. Thank you very much for your mind. So, uh, I have a couple of questions. So, what is uh, edge component? Is it horizontal component? This is actually the horizontal component. Some method of explain. Actually, the horizontal component of the earth magnetic field. But, uh, it's expected that the polar components will be affected with the surface. Surface. So, no, what, 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 because whether uh, the solar wind is coming is directly affecting the polar components of the magnetic field, earth magnetic field. No, no, no. You see, when solar wind is coming, it is very strange. Solar wind energy doesn't hit directly from the day side. It goes first on the night side. You see, if you see the magnetospheric thing, no? Um, schematic or picture or whatever. There is a very small thing which we call a polar dust, but did not discuss it here. From there, the solar wind particle can come directly. Right? That we call a polar wind or something. But their energy is very low. They, they does not um, cause much effect. Otherwise, the main energy of the solar wind comes from the day side reconnection on the magnetic path on the day side. The flux is transferred on the night side. And, and, the, and, and then the energy is stored in the night side. And then there is a reconnection and then whole energy comes to the earth. And that's how the plasma circulation inside the magnetosphere is set. But is it only the north-south magnetic component? So, the south component of the IMN, 
when it is solar and magnetic field, when it is there, you see only then magnetic reconduction on the base side takes place. If it doesn't, it is not well, even then solar wind energy is transferred but very little due to the wave particle interaction. What is the cause of the ring current? The cause of the ring current is that when the energy from the tree is injected towards the inner magnetosphere, right, the proton when they come, because of the magnetic curvature of the earth magnetic dipole field, proton goes towards um, west side and the electron goes east eastward. So it, it creates a current which circulates the earth. Uh, what is the DST is the disturbance storm, storm time. This disturbance storm time. DST. Are you expressing that in terms of nano Tesla? Yeah, it is rather than nano Tesla. You see, rain current is formed. Okay, simple. Rain current is formed. Now when there is a magnetic storm, a lot of energy is being pumped. The rain current comes closer to the earth. And it also gets intensified because more energy is being put. So its energy contents are low and it is also pushed to a closer to the earth. So when there is a ring current in the westward direction, it will produce um, the H, um, the negative, how do you say? It will produce the um, minus H, the pressure in the um, horizontal component of the earth. You can do this simple calculation. There are the spacecraft, stereo spacecraft are there, uh, which, which are going around the sun. Yeah, but so, so they observe it on the back side of the So uh, isn't this uh, like, so um, these activities affect the global uh, magnetic fields of the, of the sun? No, no, like no, no, no. You got this thing wrong. You see, when the, the, the CME, when they detected the CME, it was on the other side, not, not, not towards the earth. Yes. Um, you see, the CME which are towards, comes towards the earth and hit us, they only produce magnetic storm. Uh, yes, so but how will we detect it if we go around? Because of the stereo spacecraft, which goes around the sun and they detect it on the okay. other side, opposite side. Alright. Sun is here, earth is here, and you are the other side. So, okay. that CME was towards you, not towards me. Okay. And my second question was, uh, we have seen that uh, uh, this uh, outer planets like gas giants, have very strong magnetic field like uh, uh, Jupiter and all. And smaller rocky planets uh, completely have weaker magnetic fields. So how, how rare is it that uh, Earth is actually uh, able to have a magnetic field which is able to protect us from all of this? Yes. Earth's magnetic field is produced because as I said, due to the outer core, which is a fluid outer core, which is nickel, iron and other things, is highly conducting. So it, it is produced because of the geodynamic. As I said, the production of the magnetic, uh, magnetic field and heat reaction, they are same equation described both with one. One builds up the uh, magnetic field, other destroys the magnetic field. But the equations are the same. Only boundary conditions are different and uh, we, we get two phenomena, opposite phenomena. Yes, this side. Other side is not there. Total is not there. Data is continuous. Yes. What happened here? Uh, the magnetic field in the solar wind is towards the south one. So this yes. is continuous. Yes. So energy is being pumped towards the tail. So tail is being 
touched in the ninth century is not good, it's spontaneous, which is because of the tummy slipping, which is really yes. Now, when that happens, as far as the people that I know that, it happens at the frequency of two hours. The instability grows, the connection happens. Yeah, yeah the total substance lasts last between half an hour to one and a half hour. Yes, but yeah. then again it grows and it yes. uh, again is spontaneous on the ninth day. Hmm. The question is, whether it is the growth rate of the instability, because the magnetic field is in the opposite direction in the right side, they come closer because of the instability. No, I'll tell you what happened. But now, you have a... On the base side, you have a southward yes. IMF. And, but you see that IMF is not very strong. It is 200 Tesla or something. So the energy is going in the towards the right side. Now the system is able to adjust to new equilibrium. So, so if the energy is increasing, but the system is adjusting to the new equilibrium. So and the one is spontaneous uh, that is the release of energy. The instability condition takes time to develop. Yes, but uh, release is very fast. No? Release, release is not half an hour. Release is very fast. Now, is it only jet mode or any other mode? I'm sure that it is only jet mode. Oh, okay, as you heard this question, then let me talk to this. Now, next question is uh, the science fiction. Because you scared us that we might die in the grave with the super strong. No, 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 I'm not happy. You talked about the super strong. Can you come? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I'll just, uh, in, just uh, imagine that the velocity is to 1000 km per second per strong. Now, suppose international space station. Say what? International space stations, if I have to be there. Is it possible to do there are two part of the mission? Is it possible to detect this from before it reaches to the earth from the international space station? And if I detect it, okay. the other satellite which you are getting lost, hmm. whether there will be enough time to do something, because this is not a big deal, nano magnetic field. Hmm. So I can produce some magnetic field to the figures around the satellite to make it safe. Okay. So though it looks like science fiction, is it possible? Okay, uh, I will answer your both the question. And uh, first thing in a white tear moment, right? Uh, uh, As you have got from my thing, the, the instability which you need for reconnection, right, is, is something with which it gives the energy, right? Now, you need to see the tearing mode or any negative energy mode. Tearing mode is a negative energy mode. You know how you know the, how one can realize what is negative energy mode? If the dielectric constant with frequency derivative with frequency is negative, it is a negative energy mode. So there is a dissipation system grows. So tearing mode is basically a negative energy mode. So if you have any other negative energy mode, that will also do the work. But the question is when you see this thing, you will discount all the other modes, only this mode is only reduced. Now, what can you do your second question? Are you satisfied with this? Yes. Okay, second question. Uh, now, we have some spacecraft at Bangalore and Bang, and also some spacecraft which are very close to the sun, stereos and other. They know when there is a big solar player or CMM coming. So, we have some time now. We can, we can have half a day or something. But we, those CMM do not know whether they will really hit us. Whether they would have magnetic field in the southward direction or not, we don't know. But at the emerging point, which satellite were like AS and other, AS wind and others are there. So they can give us a 15 to 20 minutes time. Because they can tell us magnetic field is southward and all that thing. And then um, we can safeguard our satellites. So 15 to 20 minutes are enough if, if we know so it will surely hit us. But more than that, we cannot. We cannot protect it one by one. Once, you shut down the office, etc. Then everything will be chaos. Sir, so I have one small question. What is the possibility of moon violating the solar flare again? Moon solar flare again? No, moon. Actually, I have not given you moon as moon as well. Suppose moon is, see, CME is coming, and moon is on the day side. So it will be bombarded with this. So there will be a lot of spectrum.
some room for this. So you may see a lot of dust and other things. And you may, I mean, but nothing much. No, not more than that. Because it doesn't have its own magnetic field. Only magnetic anomalies are there. Mm. So you have very many, many magnetospheres. And I don't think it will matter much. It will not absorb what is happening, basically. Uh, thank you very much, Tom. You said there is a lot of spatial regions are there, the important scales are there. So other regions uh, where there is the breakdown and protection of the wire and some of the things are still important. So kinetic effects or electronic signal effects or all the effects. So can you quickly make a picture of that on the screen on this slide 26? Which location is going to happen typically? Okay, perhaps you want to say that where this neutral, near neutral line is formed, right? Yeah, for example. Yeah, but this is actually one cannot predict as such whether it will form at around uh, 6 or 3 di or 10 or 3 di or so. Th th that's very difficult to say, but once we know the system is internally unstable, but we are not monitoring the whole system. No? We don't know the complete, we know the you know, half, incomplete information. That's why we cannot say, to, okay, so much energy has been loaded in the tail, now it will become energy will be released. We, we cannot say like that, because we have only incomplete information. To so have full information, then perhaps we can say, okay, at minus 6 or 3 day, or 10 or 3 day, or 8 or 3 day. Uh, how about an opposite question? The lot of equations that you want to use is so there should be, if you scale them properly, there would be self similar in some languages. So is there a scale down experiment by the other lab, for example, in Robert's lab, where you set up a diagonal magnetic field as well as a plasma magnet, create a plasma flavor from this side? Yeah, so is there other such a work going on? Yes, yes, I think uh, UCLA, they did some experiments, scale down. Uh, in, in, India, in India? In India, I don't know. But in UCLA, uh, there was a group which was, I think, Stenzel. Stenzel. I can't do that. I think it was Stenzel. I remember that. So, so they did some experiment. They did three or four experiments. In the lab scale, when the energy is getting stored, but it may not be enough to trigger the instability spontaneously. I, I, I don't remember their result. I don't, I'm sorry. I don't remember their results, but they, they did this experiment. I, I think this is and co-worker. You see it. Yeah, oh, you said you can't put somebody in. This is going to be. I don't know that. This is going to be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sir, thank, thank you for a nice talk. I just, uh, it may be a very silly question. Since you, you identified uh, the connection uh, means of two kinds, you know, first or second time. Spontaneous and continuous. Spontaneous and continuous. Spontaneous and continuous. Spontaneous and continuous. So, yeah. yeah. so, 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 any event is always falls in either one of the category or there is a mixture from it? No, it can be a mixture also. Because, uh, in the, Magnetic storm, there are many substorm also. So it can be a mixture. So is it possible that uh, if a continuous reconnection is going to happen and in between something happens spontaneously and it can uh, happen very quickly? In, uh, the problem is, you see, the spontaneous reconnection, it will take out the energy and then it, it takes time to build up. Whereas the Violent even like magnetic storm, we are they are steadily driven because energy is being put continuously. Only then the ring, ring current gets very strong and it comes closer to the earth, and then it causes the depression in the in magnetic field of the earth, edge component of the earth. Uh, actually, why I was asking is that from the Tokamak side, if you see the sorting, uh, it's flash. So it is about to crash and uh, means even before that there is an energy activity which is not from the 14th point. 
तो कहने कैश आगे
his lifetime of working on the connection. So, we are really grateful to you. Thank you so much for coming and giving us the day. Thank you for giving me the opportunity.